as Kelly noted, on this first Sunday in March, we begin our exploration of the theme of balance. This theme was chosen for this month about five years ago by the people who design the Touchstones Journal of UU Spirituality that you receive each month if you're on our email list. It may seem tailor-made for this time, but the truth, I think, is that no matter what is going on in the world, balance in our lives is essential. Our culture does not make balance easy to find. The Protestant work ethic, so ingrained in the American psyche, is in a lot of ways the product of Calvinist religion. The Calvinists believed in a capricious God who chose willy-nilly, my interpretation, <laughs> who would be saved and who would go to hell, even before the person was born. So people in this early American belief system, prominent for much of our history and still present today, were left with desperate uncertainty about their eternal destinies. They would look for clues to God's feelings about them. The only way to know whether a person was destined for heaven or hell was to gauge how the person's life was going. Did God seem to be holding the person in favor? Were things looking up? That was a good sign. Hard work became a virtue, a good sign of heavenly favor, as did wealth and the use of wealth for charitable purposes. These days, the Protestant work ethic is secular. The holy is almost completely removed from the equation. But the old framework is still there, and we're still hanging things on it. Those with money are seen often as blessed. The poor are blamed for lack of work ethic. Much-needed balance is often characterized as a lack of ambition, and a million different businesses cater to and compete for the dollars of the frantic, overworked, so-called blessed. An old story points out the absurdity of living our lives this way. As the story goes, a business executive from the East Coast was on vacation relaxing on a beach in small town California when a fishing boat came to shore. The executive noticed an enormous catch and complimented the captain on the size of the catch and how, asked how long did it take to catch that many fish. Not long, was the reply. Well, then the vacationing executive asked, why didn't you stay out longer? Because, the captain said, this is enough for me and my family. I'll sell some and we'll eat some. It's enough. The executive was curious. So what do you do with the rest of your time? Well, the captain said, I sleep late. I fish for a while. Play with my children. Take a nap. Spend some time with my spouse. Then in the evening, I go to visit my friends in town. I have a few drinks. I play guitar. I sing a few songs. I volunteer in several organizations. I have a full life. The vacationer was surprised and wanted to help. <laughs> I have an MBA from Harvard and I can help you. You should spend more time on the water fishing, then you can sell the extra fish, make more money, and buy a bigger boat. And the boat captain asked after that, with the extra money from the bigger boat, you can buy two or three boats and eventually hire more people to operate a fleet of fishing trawlers. Instead of selling your fish to a distributor, you can start to negotiate directly with the processing plants, and after a while, you'll be able to operate your own processing plant. Then you can leave this little town, quaint, but you know, for New York City. From there, you could operate the whole enterprise. The captain asks, how long will that take? The executive says, 20 to 25 years, I would guess. And after that? Well, my friend, the executive says, that's where the fun starts. When the business gets really big, you can sell stock in the company and make millions. Wow, millions, the captain said. I like the sound of that. What happens after that? After that, you'll be able to retire on the coast here. Sleep in every day, do some fishing, play with your grandkids, take a nap, spend time with your spouse. 
The captain just shrugged and walked away. <laughs> this little story oversimplifies some things. There's no doubt about that. I, our lives have seasons, and uh, some seasons are busier than others. But at the heart of that little narrative, I think, is a core truth espoused in one way or another by all the world's major religions. Life is best lived in balance, not looking forward to a time when we'll have balance. Rather, to the best of our ability, we're at our best when we can find balance in the often hectic here and now. Yet, again, there's a danger of oversimplification here. We will drive ourselves to distraction, trying to maintain constant balance. I like the reminder from one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman. He said, sometimes the way to do what you hope to do will be clear cut and sometimes it'll be almost impossible to decide whether or not you're doing the correct thing because you'll have to balance your goals and hopes with feeding yourself, paying debts, finding work, and settling for what you can get, end quote. We live in such a dualistic world. Either you're saved or you're not. Either you're healthy or you're not. You're happy or unhappy. You're balanced or you're not balanced. But balance is more like a person walking a balance beam. People who do it well make it look effortless, but the way across the beam is anything but effortless. The person is making constant, tiny adjustments, veering left and adjusting back right, swerving imperceptibly right and, and balancing back left. The shifts are constant. So it is, I think, with balance in our own lives. No one gets it right once for all. The work is to catch our imbalances more and more quickly so that the adjustments required to regain balance are smaller and smaller. I want to offer you a few things that I find helpful to keep in mind on my way across the balance beam, and maybe they'll be helpful to you. The first is to know yourself. Know what is most important to you and keep that most important thing most important. For me, I know that family is most important. Specifically, time with my wife and my kids, as often as possible doing not a whole lot of anything, just being with one another. When I have that time, I feel energized and excited about other parts of my life. When I'm veering too far away from that balance, I notice I feel frustrated and tired and just generally grouchy. What is it for you that's most important? Is it alone time? Time spent in nature, reading, whatever your most important thing is, don't fall for the old Protestant work ethic lie that it's selfish to take time to do it. Because whatever the important work you're doing that keeps you busy, you'll probably do it better if you're maintaining balance, keeping first things first. Now, I'm not advocating for a Jimmy Buffett-style life on the beach because the second thing I think we need in our lives to maintain balance is time spent doing things that make the impact we want to make on the world. The seventh of the Unitarian Universalist principles is the reminder that we are part of an interdependent web of existence. In other words, we don't live in a vacuum. We're part of a web of living beings that requires our time and attention. And because there's just no escaping that, it is, it seems to me, impossible to live a truly balanced life without giving back to others in that web. So I ask again, what is it for you? What is your personal life mission? What difference do you want to make in the world? And how will you go about doing it? Here's the thing. I know who I'm talking to. I don't think too many of us will just opt out of doing good. That's not the danger, I don't think. I think we're more likely to decide that the good thing we want to do in the world is to save the world. And then we become social justice firecrackers. We make a boom, but in the end, all we do is destroy ourselves. 
I encourage you to be specific. What's the difference you want to make in the world? How will you do it? Then make time for that thing. Make time for what's most important for you. Make time to make a difference. But third, and sometimes related to the first, is don't forget to do things that bring you joy. Perhaps having no other productive use for anyone else in the world than just that, to bring you joy. I catch myself sometimes buying into the Protestant work ethic, projecting this image of busyness. After all, otherwise, how would you know what a good person I am if you didn't know how busy I was? (laughs) Yuck. (laughs) But when I'm in balance, I keep in touch with a couple sources of joy that I want to sort of confess to you this morning. I imagine they might make your sources of joy seem more grown up and respectable. (laughs) One, I read graphic novels. Kind of like comic books for big kids. One of my favorites is about a preacher who is chasing God to the ends of the universe because God has abducted the throne and let things turn ugly on earth. Seems oddly reasonable to me. (laughs) Others are related to justice themes, including March, the fantastic graphic novel by Congressman John Lewis about his experience marching with Dr. King in Selma. But I love these books, and I can feel a different part of my personality engaging with them than when I read nonfiction. I almost always have a graphic novel or two or three going. And I play video games. Now, they are an absolute escape. They're no good for anything, (laughs) except that they make me happy. That's all they're for. And that's why I decided several years ago, when I was deciding whether to be a complete grown-up or not, (laughs) to keep playing them now and then. Just like President Frank Underwood on House of Cards, by the way. (laughs) Simply because they bring me joy. There's something that brings you joy. Are you making time for it? Whatever it is... I hope you know that you're worth having such things in your life. You are not just a consumer, a friend, a parent, a sibling, a citizen. You are a full person with a need for joy. It's not really a luxury. Find it. Embrace joy in whatever forms it comes to you. It is good and right for you to find joy. We are such complex creatures. It's all too easy to neglect the spiritual side of ourselves in favor of constantly doing. Even in our faith communities, sometimes doing seems more important than developing who we are at our cores. But it seems to me what we really need is balance between what's most important, the difference we want to make, and pure joy in our lives. Oscar Wilde wrote, The final mystery is oneself. When one has weighed the sun in the balance and measured the steps of the moon and mapped out the heavens star by star, there still remains oneself. Who can calculate the orbit of their own soul? It takes time to explore and nourish the contours of our spirits takes time to find balance. This month and all through our lives, let us practice returning again and again and again to balance. Amen.